Hello, everyone, and welcome to American Thought Leaders Now. I'm Yanya Kellek. Today, our very special guest is Tiffany Meyer. She is the host and producer of a wonderful new film, Hollywood Takeover, and also the host of China in Focus, NTD's big show. Tiffany, so good to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. I learned a number of things in the film that I simply did not know about. And I thought I knew a lot about, for example, the Chinese dictator Jiang Zemin, who I view as one of the most pernicious of the recent. And you talk about in the film about a moment where he watched the film Titanic and kind of made a decision. He had this profound impact on him and he realizes, you know, the cultural impact that film can have. Tell me about that. Yeah, so that was quite a fascinating development in the history of the Communist Party, right? He watches this film. It had such a huge impact on him. Like you mentioned, he goes back to China and he orders his entire Politburo. These are like the most powerful men in China to watch this film. <laughs> Imagine like you're a soldier or something and your commander's like, watch Titanic. So you're sitting there for like three hours watching this like romance unfold. But his whole message with that is like, don't underestimate that we're the only country that understands the power of emotion because that's what struck him so much, the emotional appeal of that movie. And so then throughout the years, you're seeing that play out in all different aspects when it comes to soft power. Often when we think of China or any other country, we think of military might or hard power, if you will. But soft power gets less of a focus. And through that, they've started to really influence how we see and feel about the world, right? So in movies, you see the nine dash line, which is China's claims in that region. And you go to the movie to be entertained. You're not there to be like, oh, what are they going to try and drill in me? So then you take in a lot of info without realizing it. So for instance, like in the 2012 movie, if anyone watched that, the end of the world film, you know, everyone gets saved because the Chinese regime decided to build a massive arc, probably with slave labor, but no one talks about that. And then you have Sandra Bullock in Gravity being saved by the Chinese. She ends up in the Chinese space station, not the ISS with the US and the Russians, right? So throughout the years, we're getting this propaganda drilled into us. Meanwhile, the real story of the Chinese people, right? The people who are suffering there, who've lost everything, who were locked down in the pandemic, were being silenced for their faith or anything, even house Christians, the Tibetans, you don't hear that story. And so what the Communist Party has done through emotion is they have the world tell each other their version of communist China that the communist party wants without even the communist party having to come in and be like, this is how we want it written. It's gotten to that point where the whole world sees China the way communist China wants it to be seen. You know, it's amazing that you have Chris Fenton, you know, the dragon feeder, as he calls himself on, I think he was one of the people who really opened my eyes some years back to the realities of how the business of Hollywood actually works in China. In Looper, you know, he talks about how the Chinese regime doesn't like time travel in films. In fact, they figured out a way to get Looper into the Chinese market by basically field testing among Chinese audiences and Chinese regime officials a scene. So that is an astonishing level of influence. I mean, we a lot of people have heard about the Taiwanese flag being scrubbed from the jacket of uh, Tom Cruise. Chris in the film talks about these scenarios where the executives start to think to themselves, what can we do? How can we structure the narrative so that the Chinese will be very happy? Which really means, how do we create something that will fulfill the Chinese Communist Party, not just internal propaganda, but worldwide propaganda influence efforts. Yeah, you do see that in the Looper example. And then after that, he then helped get Iron Man 3 into China, right? So Marvel approached them, was like, hey, you know, Looper had like maybe $80 million. What can you do with $200 million? And obviously Marvel's very secretive. So Chris Fenton talks about how they were locked in a room and had like 90 minutes to read the entire Marvel script and try and figure out where they can start adding elements of China to get into that market. And so the end version, you have Dr. Wu who saves the life of Iron Man, right? Imagine this American hero who's saved by China's breakthrough in technology. And what, does, what that does on the world stage when you start seeing that kind of innovation and skill that's unmatched even by these superheroes. 
And that movie did fantastic in China, right? So after that, you see studios, to your point, self-censoring because they're trying to get past the censors and into that massive market. Because you had, say, Pacific Rim, which made about $109 million in the U.S. That's far below its budget of $190 million. But in China alone, that same movie, Pacific Rim, made $111 million. So just by using the China market, it's doubled its box office. So now you have studios who are like, oh, it doesn't really matter if I don't do well in, say, North America. As long as I can get into that China market, I'm going to make a profit. So you got to the point where studios... We're just doing anything and everything they could to get into that market without thinking about what the fallout would be on, say, Americans and the world, right? So you saw that whole change until the point where Chris Fenton gets like punched in the nose and realizes, oh, maybe this isn't good for the future of his children in America or the world more broadly. And he starts being really concerned with what's happened. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually touched by this. I didn't actually understand fully why he called himself the dragon feeder until the film, and because he sees himself with that label, like he was feeding the dragon, and now his task is to try to expose that activity. This whole Dr. Wu, did you say example in Iron Man 3? You know, the irony perhaps is that, you know, China's technical growth was achieved through theft and forced technology transfer to the 99.9% which continues, you know, and there's, you know, Google uh, research labs continue to function in China in a situation where, of course, all of that needs to be available to the Chinese regime for, for you know, cooperation purposes, which is terribly ironic that the message that's being sent is one of this incredible Chinese Communist Party innovation or success story. There is a, there is a kind of success story, but I think it was partially because the blinders were you know, sort of put on the Americans and perhaps the money as is referenced multiple times in the film was just too good. You do see that throughout not just Hollywood, right, but any industry really. But I just felt like Hollywood was such a great example that many people could understand and notice if we talk about, say, politics, maybe a lot of people would tune out in the first two seconds, right? <laughs> um, and so you do see that in all sorts of aspects where whether it's just the money aspect or us teaching them the skills because now you have china making their own movies that are at the same level as what hollywood can produce china studios are like we don't need your know-how we don't need your money we can produce our own films that our viewers like better than whatever you can bring in we don't need you anymore and it's gone to the point where you had like Senshi and the Legend of the Ten Rings or Eternals, these Marvel films you would think would be custom made for a Chinese audience, right? Chinese led cast, crew, everything. But they didn't end up in China. And Simu Liu, who's the lead actor in Senshi, in like 2017, he said something slightly negative about the Communist Party, about his parents, like his parents' experience. And because of that, the film didn't end up there. Mm -hmm. Eternals, the director Chloe Zhao, Back in the day, she said something slightly negative, and that movie didn't end up. So now you're seeing studios look at that and they're like, wait, is it worth it anymore? Can we even get into that? And then as you mentioned Top Gun earlier, right, you saw where the jacket patches were changed in the trailer. And at the time, Tencent, this Chinese tech giant, was funding the film. Mm -hmm. But because of this international outrage and backlash, Tencent pulled out of backing it. And then we had the pandemic, so a lot of movies were delayed and there were changes that could be made because it's a lot more time. So by the time Top Gun came out, the patches were back and it became, you know, the normal patriotic U.S. film that did super well, pass a billion dollars without the China market. This is the first Tom Cruise movie to pass a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So now you're seeing hints of that where it's like, okay, the Chinese audience kind of prefers their own propaganda films. They don't really need the Western made films that are finding it harder and harder to get into that market. Mm -hmm. And Hollywood is like, oh, maybe I can go back to telling my stories the way I want it to without bending backwards to self-censor. That would be hopeful, I suppose, right? But I, I can't help but think that this is also sort of in a context when there's a lot of films being made that are actually aren't very pro-American at all. You know, Roger Simon in the film, of course, our uh, editor at large at Epoch, you know, he's in there, he's a member of the Academy. He's written an um, Oscar nominated screenplay or maybe even two. But uh, he basically talks about how film was kind of taught the world what America was, 
at one point. And that's, so it's, it was, it was, it was a major soft power play. And so I, I keep thinking about this hubris of, you know, us, uh, 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 kind of in the West imagining that we would change China by going in there, by investing. Cause that was the mantra. A lot of people believe that Chris mentions it in the film, but so many people I've talked to talk about this. Um, and when, it, when in fact, you know, that incredible power of soft power was, it was almost kind of reversed. Hollywood started producing films that are basically, you know, anti-American or anti-American culture. And, and at the same time, for the reasons you described, very kind of pro Chinese regime vision of the world. So you think that's changing, that's interesting. There are hints of that. A lot of it had to do with the pandemic and we saw in China, they had the draconian lockdown. So theaters weren't open. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you wanted to get your film in, not, no one could see them, no one, nothing was open. Mm. And then you do have also the internal change in sentiment where after the pandemic, a censors let in less films to begin with, but then also the Chinese people themselves prefer to watch their own propaganda films, right? Whether it's like the China Korean or China Japan wars, where, you know, China has their version of history and uh, the Japanese people are terrible because there's a long time rivalry there. Those are the films that are doing really well in China's box office. So from the Western perspective, they're like, wait, these two movies that we thought were going to get in, Senshin, The Legend, and Rings, The Eternals didn't. We're now seeing this change in sentiment to the point where in the film, Chris Fenton talks about now you do have studios greenlighting films with zero in the box for the China box office, where they're just like, you can make this film and still be profitable without China entirely. And I think you're also seeing the rise in the independent film industry more so too, because there's so many different streaming services now. You saw The Sound of Freedom did quite well in movies. That's from Angel Studios and, and just these studios who want to tell the stories they want to tell and having that resonate with viewers. This reminds me of a moment, Chris references it, because I remember a ton of people send me these screenshots when, uh, uh, I, I forget which film, but one of the Doctor Strange films, there was an Epoch Times newsstand it was like, how did this get into the, so just, do you know the story behind that? I, I actually didn't know. I just know that it happened and Chris references it. So I think with that, cause it's shot in New York city. And as we all know, those <laughs> are quite prevalent throughout the city. And I think it was probably just too hard to remove it and stuff. They didn't think much of it, mm -hmm. put it in there. It's like split second that you see it on like the lower corner of the screen, mm -hmm. all the actions over here. Mm -hmm. Right. And some are saying because of that, it didn't enter the China market. It's quite hard for Marvel movies in general to get in. Um, but then but you that, are- That probably didn't help, I see. It right. did not, yeah. no. Yeah. Even though, cause they, in what the, one of the earlier Doctor Strange, they cast this Tibetan character as a white Celtic woman instead to try and you know, help. Cause Tibet is one of the three T's. It's a very sensitive subject to the communist party. There's also Tibet, Taiwan, and Tiananmen Square. Can't touch, can't touch those. And so you see all these different changes that are being made, but then you do see that box, the Chinese edition of the Epic Times or DJY in there. But then you, uh, if you go online, there's like so many chat rooms where they're like, Chinese people wouldn't even know what that stands for, you know? But just the, the fear that the communist regime has, back to the time travel point, right? They want control over everything. So for instance, even in Black Adam, there was one line that talks about the Dalai Lama. Because of that one line, the movie didn't end up in China. That's like how much control the regime wants over everything. And so when it comes to time travel, very hard to control the past and the future and the present. How did you become the China expert that you are? I mean, you've, you've, you've been in this realm now for quite a number of years. You've been, you yourself has faced this kind of Chinese soft power with perhaps without realizing the the details of it. Tell me about that. It's an interesting journey, I guess you could say. I started with, so Entity has their different TV shows. I had a midday show and I was actually in charge of writing the soft news. So like very cute animal stories, but I'd also write international news. And then we got the story about the unknown pneumonia that was coming out of Hong Kong, which we later all know as the pandemic. And we do have an underground network inside China that can get us information, right? Because China, lack of transparency, it's really hard to get any news out of there that's not propaganda. 
And because of that, as the pandemic developed into a pandemic, we were getting more and more info to the point that we couldn't just squish it into all of our other shows. Mm -hmm. We just had too much information. And it was like, well, we need to make this into its own show. And so that's how China in Focus was born. And then because I was already covering the pneumonia at the time and everything, and then because I am half Asian, my mom's from Taiwan, I can't understand Mandarin and stuff, they're like, only you out of the anchors we have can handle this because you have to be able to understand Chinese. Um, and then that crew, but also kind of taking a step back, I do have my own personal story when it comes to China because my mom's from Taiwan, but my grandfather fled China during the Civil War. And at the time, everyone thought it was going to be a very short thing, right? It's like, oh, whatever, low conflict, we can go back home. That never happened. So what happened is he never saw his family again. Mm -hmm. And so every year when it came time to Mother's Day, he would go into the mountains and look towards the mainland because he can't talk to his mom. And just that kind of impact on the Chinese people. We don't get to hear those stories. We don't see the damage it's done. And often Chinese Communist Party likes to talk about, oh, you know, you can't have your outside foreign influence on our system. But it's like Marxism is foreign to China. It came from Europe, from Karl Marx, right? And then it's been put on the Chinese people who had their own history. It was a very divine history. And you see the suffering of the Chinese people, whether that was the manufactured famine under Mao, where conservative estimates are 44 million people died. No one talks about that. And to the point where even in our company, a lot of our reporters can't be on screen because they have family back home in China. So just the sheer pressure and influence, the long arm of the Chinese Communist Party is everywhere. And it's even gotten into our systems, our education systems, what you learn in school, what you see everywhere to the point that we don't realize we're being influenced by something like that. You know. As we finish up, I want to mention, you know, you have the filmmaker Jason Jones in the film who also runs the Vulnerable People's Project. And he, I mean, he talks about a number of things in there. One of the things he talks about, he really wants to be able to tell the stories of these, the sort of the various minorities, which are, you know, hundreds of million, you know, many hundreds of millions of people that are actually, you know, either targeted genocidally by the regime or in, at some extreme level. Um, and I, I think that's maybe, maybe we should finish with that because that you've also been telling their stories actually. Yeah, Jason Jones is an interesting case because he really thinks the future where all the stories are coming from is from a free China when the Communist Party isn't in control and it has the freedom to tell its own stories because one of his main points is the one child policy really impacted everyone didn't matter if you were the party secretary's wife you know you also had to set an example you would have to abort your kids and then if you were a peasant right same treatment and he really thinks that will be the way to bring down the communist party because the people suffered so much and that's what the communist party fears the most its own people realizing that it is an illegitimate power and that it doesn't have power over them that's where he really sees the hope of the future, right? That a free China can tell all of its thousands of years of stories and be able to do that and help us maybe learn some things. Well, Tiffany Meyer, it's such a pleasure to have had you on and we'll have you on again. It's been an honor. There's something magical about the movies that I just love. Hollywood invented America to the world in the old days. And as a medium, it's really powerful. But for some, that power isn't used for good. Sure, our way of life is being censored by the Chinese Communist Party. They said, we get a lot of our money out of China. Is there any way you could make this movie a little bit more attractive to the Chinese? Is it really just about money? Are there other parts at stake? I had friends in Hollywood who said, this will kill your career. You won't get funding. They're afraid of even mentioning one line. Chinese influence was playing into what we see in US films. China said, you can't have that in there. And Hollywood listened. This is insane. This is a joke, right? We raised our hand and we dove right into it. 
But over time, all of us have been punched in the nose. The Chinese Communist Party followed no rules. What's at stake? The soul of the nation is at stake. We want indoctrination access to America. They could basically take over America without firing a shot because they control access to our minds. And we all know that their goal is global domination. People have been brainwashed without knowing it.